problem, all right? You've talked about it, like header cracks, all right? Most of the time, when you see a header crack, it's due to this right here. <coughs> Lubrication penetrating the column, all right? And it's not on the die. It's on the back. It's not out there on the cap. It's on the back of the die. It's usually where you can create a bridge crack or a lamination, all right? And how you do that is, is when you look in a die and you're putting too much lube in the back and your lubrication rings wore out whatever die you're running, it has a lubrication ring. So your lubrication rings wore out and you don't have anywhere for that lube to be carried in that die. So all it does is penetrate the clay as it's coming through because there's no lip there anymore. All right? So how we design our die, we don't have an oil ring, and I'll show you this later on. We don't have a, an oil ring in the die in the back like this little extra piece. We actually build it in the liner. So everywhere we lube, we have an eighth inch lip when it starts out new, okay? And if I stick my hand in the front like this, I'll hit those lips. So everywhere I got a section, I've got a lip. So when I start out lubricating the back, I'm lubricating in this lip. I'm not pushing into the material, all right? And then as I come across, then the lube stay on the outside, not coming into the material, and then getting on the bridge. Because once it gets on the bridge, it's slick. And then it doesn't want to knit back together. And then that's how you get that bridge crack, all right? Also, run, run augers low increases column temperature because what it's doing is you don't have anything in behind it to push. So the material is just slipping on the auger and you get, a hot, you get a hot barrel. And a hot barrel comes all the way up to the die and you get a hot die and then you got a hot product coming out. And then you're, setting, you're, running, a, you're running a column that's 100 and something degrees in an environment that's 80. You're shocking that material when you do that. All right? All right. And then you get lower pro productivity rates if you don't fill the machine up and inconsistent product quality. Go on to the next one. I'm not holding y'all at fault because a lot of times what happens is, I know out here in Texas most of y'all run king size product all day long, whatever. So you don't change products a whole lot. Some, some people run mods, stuff like that, but not, not a lot. But one of the number one things I see in the industry is, is say I'm running utilities, I'm running modulars, queens, kings, these Canadian premieres or maxes, whatever all the competitors want to call them and all that. So I'm running all these sizes. Well my system was set up with a shiv and a motor. All right? So all these products are going to have different feed rates because they're not, the profiles are different. The bigger the brick, the slower it comes out, but it's the same amount of material because you're just pushing that much material, but it doesn't come out as fast because it's a larger opening. That makes sense? It's a larger brick, same amount of material that's coming out. But then I go down and say in that plant I'm running queen size. Well, a queen size is only two and three quarter, eight inches long. That darn thing scoots out of there like crazy. It just, because it's a smaller opening. It's like putting your finger over the end of a water hose. All right? It's going to go faster. So what do people do? The only thing they can do, they turn the feed rate down. So what's that do? You got less feed. So what happens to the plug sealer? It's got less material in it. You lose vacuum. Then what happens to the extruder? You got less material in the extruder, so you got less dense brick. All right? So the optimum thing, and it's not feasible, it's not feasible to go change and shift every time you change Every time you change sizes, we all know that we can't do that to slow the machine down. But the best feasible thing, which costs a lot of money, is to put VFDs on your extruder pug sealer. Variable frequency drives. Because then, when you change product sizes or materials, some materials don't extrude as well as others. You know, you can have a high clay content material that doesn't extrude as well, and you have to turn it back. Or it might be the opposite. Fire, you might have a good fire clay that runs out of there like water. You got to turn it up. All right? So the best optimum thing would be to have a VFD on the extruder and on the puck sealer and be able to turn the speed down to have optimum extrusion efficiency. Okay? 
best extrusion efficiency that you can have. And then another thing that does, when people talk about spending the money to do that, and I've had both. I've had just regular engage clutch, bam, and I've had a VFDs, you know, VFDs on extruder. What it ends up doing, and it's hard to quantify it to get capital money to do it, but what it ends up doing is it starts making the augers last longer because you find out that you don't have to turn them as fast as you was turning them before. Most VFDs that I put in, you start off, you put them in, and you've had you're you're down about 80 percent of what that of what that what it would run at. You know, you're down. You only have to run about 80 percent on most of them, and you get plenty to feed any any set machine that you have today. All right, which I said set machine that brings up another factor there. Usually we have a throttler in the system, what I call a throttler. And that would be a slug cutter, it don't work good. A set machine that's old as the hills. And it can't set them fast as you can extrude them. So what do you, what's, your, what's your option? You gotta slow the material down and you gotta extrude slower to put a band-aid on this little piece of system we got down here. So those are all, when you think about improvement projects or something like that, then if you can go the VFD route, then that, that makes life a lot easier on extruder. And also extends the wear life of the augers because you run slower, and then when you need, when they start getting wore out, you can turn them up. You, you can turn the VFD up and you can run them a little bit longer. Alright, All right, so the opposite is, is a full machine. What's that give you? It gives you the exact opposite of what the, the running it empty would be. You get consistent column density, consistent die balance due to consistent densities, consistent column speeds, uh, no column shift. You ever run a, run a product and it just wants to walk all around on you and you can see every time the auger turns. You can see it move. You know, uh, you know I've seen stuff like that. When you run it real low and then the column wants to walk around because you run it so slow and then an auger feeds a little bit and then it don't and then it feeds a little bit and everybody's going why is the column going back and forth? Well probably if we could fill this thing up it'd run out straight. Right. And then you don't get any uh, lubrication penetration, no lamination, increased productivity and more consistent quality product. Alright. Alright. So now we get down to some basics here and the only reason I bring the basics up is because I see them in plants. I, can, I guarantee you we could go out here and we could walk the yard and it would happen anywhere and we would find these little issues. Okay. So when we look at that brick, what's wrong with it? That's right. But the bridge is not centered. Why? The tension's in the, the, the you know, you got to do the details, all right? Because it really does matter. Do the details. So initially, what's going to happen, what's going to happen when we start the extruder up to run this brick out? What's that column going to do? It's going to do it. Promise you. What's it going to do? All this material coming out. Huh? What? It's going to do just like this. It's going to come out and it's going to go up. It's going to go up. Why is it going to go up? Because the material on the bottom is going to move a lot easier than the material on the top. It's going to do just like this. All right. Next picture. All right. So you can see right down here, I'm in Australia and I did that. Set brick up, and I was doing some very thin webs, eight millimeter webs. So that's forty-eight percent product, void product. I had the bridge a little high. The material comes out, goes right up. But in our system, you can move the bridge on a go. So I moved the bridge down. You know, kept running, got that, got that lined up. So make sure bridge is centered. Up and down, right and left. Did you have a question? No. Oh, I thought I saw you raise your hand. All right, next. All right, same thing. We got the opposite here. We got too much material on top. You know, more on top than we do the bottom. What's going to happen there? Column's going to dive down when it comes out. Going to dive down. You know, I've seen people fight stuff and fight stuff, and it's all because of that. Proper setup. All right. Next. 
All right, so this is an actual brick. I was at a company that makes a uh, commercial product in uh, South Carolina. They make a very good product. They're running brick that looks like that. The manager wasn't out there. The, the supervisor wasn't out there. One operator. And he's running the extruder and the set machine, and they're making commercial product. He's running the and the set machine. And the set machine. And he does that all day, every day. Right there. Br bridge wasn't centered. We had that same plant one day. They said, uh, I'm not, I'm not uh, oiling on the front of the die. Can't get no oil. Can't get no oil. And I said, well, let's stop a minute and let's see what the problem is. I said, I want to pull that cap. Oh, we got production to run. And I'm like, well, you're off more than you're on. So let's take 15 minutes and let's figure out what's going on. So I pull a cap off. Somebody cut a gasket and they didn't put no lubrication points in it. None. There was nowhere for the oil to go. It was going on the outside of the die. And I'm like, we, we cut a new gasket, put it on there, and we're running. Supervisor's like, I can't believe they cut a gasket like that. And it, <laughs> but they've been doing that for two days, according to the operator. So, you know, just just a small little thing. All right. Next. All right. So, uh, y'all y'all will understand that in a Raymond die you have bridge adjustment bolts. All right. What that does is that allows you to move the bridge where you need to move it. All right. While you're running. All right. The competitor has tried to do this too, but one thing that they failed to do was was actually hold the bridge. And y'all know that we bolt our bridge in with four bolts on the on the uh, pads, the bridge pads. They bolt in. You got four bolts, and you tighten those bolts hand tight. Okay, you tighten them hand tight because you're holding the bridge in place with the bridge adjustment bolts. Okay? You're holding them in place with that. They're tight against the bridge. The four bolts are just hand tight that hold on the pads. Okay? All right. The competitor, what they've done, they, they created a pocket in there, but they didn't bolt it to anything. So what happens is, is when they try to move that bridge up and down, right and left, it'll pitch on them back and forth. It won't just move the whole thing up and down. So they forgot that little tidbit of of what they should have been doing on that to make that work effectively up and down. All right. Now, if you're back in the day and you're running a K die or GN die or something like that, then you got the same problem because you just got a little pocket there with with your little two slabs on the outside, and it's not very secure anyway. So you probably try to shim it when you start up and hope it stays in place. All right. But you don't have to do that. All right. Now with this die. This is actually a new die. It looks different than anything y'all have in Acme right now. All right? This is actually called a QC die. All right? So what we did on that QC die, we believe as a business that you service everything that you've got out there. But we think that if you're not moving forward and making improvements, then you, you can't stay the same. You're only going to go backwards. It doesn't, it doesn't work. If... if if, if, if we were all professional athletes, we couldn't just stay right like today we are today if we didn't do some type of physical conditioning or make a change, right? Or our diet or whatever, whatever it might be. And you're going to get older anyway. So you're going to have to step up your training as you get older to stay where you're at. Same way with a business. If you're not making changes, making improvements, somebody's on your heels, trying to copy what you do, or trying to be better than you, you're going to get behind. So we're always trying to make improvements. So what we did with this die is, we actually bolt, and I'll show you all later, but we actually bolt the bridge to the back of the center section. All right? And then the bridge fits back in the pockets just like it always does, and it's still adjustable by the pads, but in order to make a bridge change now, all you do is hook the hoist to this eye bolt right here, loosen these 12 bolts, bump it off with the extruder, take the, take the bridge off the center section, put it back, and then clean the surface of your bridge ring and your center section up, put them back on there, bolt it back up, and you're done. You don't even have to dig the back of the die out. 
Now this is different than what most of you guys. Yeah, have. none of y'all have that. None of you guys got yeah. that. You now know. I have it in the states. Um, Raglan brick, just got a king size unit like that. Uh, uh, Bessemer, just bought a king size unit like that. Boral Bessemer. Um, General Shell, Blue Ridge 36, that's in Roanoke, Virginia. Just put this system in. So, and then I've got them. That's what I started up the UK with. I've got the, every unit I've got in the UK is a quick change unit. Right? And the reason we call it a quick change unit is because you can change the bridge out from the front and you don't have to dig the back out to do it. All right. All right. Next. All right. This is simple brick making 101 too, but we leave it in there because we see it places. Okay? <laughs> so we so when you when we originally set a die up, all right, when we set a die up brand new, the cores are always recessed inside the cap a sixteenth of an inch. Okay? A sixteenth of an inch inside the cap. Anybody tell me why you do that? Thank you. Huh? Thank you. Yeah, afterwards, yep, yeah, they will expand. All right, that's a good one. All right, so on this die, your final sizing, you see that flat in there? That's the final sizing. Say we're making 3 and 15 sixteenths brick in the bed. All right, so we got the final sizing right here. We want that material, that core, to be in the final sizing of that die so that you get full compaction, Okay. If you're outside of that, if you're sticking outside the cap, if you're sticking outside the cap, then what it'll want to do is open back up. All right. So you want when you set a die up and you look, you make sure that those cores are a sixteenth inside the cap. Okay. All right. Now I say a sixteenth. Don't put them back there a quarter inch inside the cap because what that does. Is that creates a less compacted brick because you're not you're not coming you're not finishing out at final sizing, but and the cores are recessed inside the cap, so there's less dense around the cores. Then you want them sixteenth of an inch at final sizing, so that you're fully compacted around those cores. All right, don't have them sticking outside. People ask, well, how does it get that way? Okay, so these are reasons it gets that way. One reason that I've seen out in the field more than anything is somebody buys their cores from some Chinese manufacturer and they think they're saving money. All right? So then when they start looking, they start looking and they start measuring cores and say your core is supposed to be two inches long and I've had this happen in the field. I'm supposed to have a two inch long core on a, on a, on a three hole modular product, say, okay? I start measuring cores, and this guy's got one that's an inch and 15 sixteenths. He's got one that's an inch and seven eighths, and then he's got one that's two and an eighth. All from the same supplier, all in the same batch. Okay? So if I make a core and it's supposed to be two inches long, and I got it on the original setup, recessed it inside the cap a sixteenth of an inch, and it's two and an eighth, guess what? It's sticking outside the cap a sixteenth of an inch. That's how that happens. All right? Another way it happens is, is we make replaceable stems, right? All right. So you wear your stems out before you wear your bridge bar out. So you're going to replace your stems like it's made. Okay. So you loosen them up and bump that sucker out there, and you got your stems in your hand, and you're digging back. You know, you're digging back in there, and oh, I got it clean enough, and you start tightening it up. And you push all this clay back there, and now your stem's not always tied against the bridge bar. That's another way it happens. All right. So those are they say how's that happen? All right. So that's how that crap happens. So make sure when somebody sets the die up for you that you're doing it, you know, and, and checking that. Make sure the cores ain't sticking outside the cap. All right. And then another thing, this 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 gets on my nerves more than anything, and I don't even have it up there right now. But I walk into a plant and, it, and the, they got the door swung or they got the hydraulic die changer over and you look in a die. And that die, 
the material inside it dies as hard as that wall right there. And you're like, how long has that been over there? <laughs> oh, I don't know. We, we switched over there. It's been three weeks ago, something like that. You know, you're like, when are you going to clean it out? You know, when are you going to inspect it to have it ready for the next time? But nobody wants to dig it out. You know, it, it, just go ahead, dig them out, see what you got in there, see if you still got lubrication lips, see if the bridge is still in good shape. Get it ready for the next time. All right, get it ready for the next time, because that. And, and and I love it. And a lot of people don't do this, but I've got some plants that change over a lot. And Belden being one of them, Belden brick. And I don't know if y'all familiar with Belden, but Belden makes a. I mean, anybody will tell you, they, any brick manufacturer will tell you, Belden makes a premier product. They really do, and they and they pride themselves on it. But but they have really made their own standard in a way which it's hard for them to achieve sometimes because they hold their brick in such high quality. Well, they got a die guy because they might change over in a plant. They might change over four times in a day, you know, because they're in profiles. I don't know. I'm talking about they'll go from running Monarchs at 9 o'clock in the morning to running Queen Size at, at 12, you know. So, but they have a guy that he's a setup guy. And he's got the die ready. He knows that it's going to lube. He knows all the ports are clear. He knows that everything's been measured to the to the half a millimeter on that thing. And when they put it on a machine, it runs. But it's hard to convince a lot of people that that's the way it should be. But it'd be nice if everybody if everybody did that. It'd be really nice. It'd make my job easy. It'd make my job real easy. All right, next. All right, so all this becomes even more important. And don't say never. Don't say never, all right? Because all this would take in the brick industry today, and y'all would love it. Y'all would actually love it from a business standpoint if the world, if the United States did like a lot of people do in the world, all right? So when you look at this brick right here, this is a backing brick. And what's meant by backing brick is they actually put that, that is the wall right, on the inside. And then they have brick on the outside. Or they use this as a through the wall unit and render it. Put stucco on it. All right, hard coat stucco. Not, not ephus or whatever. All right. But the key to this is, is it's a hollow block basically. All right. So anybody tell me what a void, oh I got it on there. Sorry. I was going to say, somebody guess how much void that is, all right? So it's upwards of 50%, all right? Now, this, this right here is less than 8 millimeter wall thickness, and less, it's about 7.5 millimeter, and less than 7.5 millimeter webs. That's a light brick, 400 millimeters long. It's a beautiful product, and I'm making that at uh, Midland Brick, which is part of the Boral Group, and uh, Austral Armandale, which is in Western, both of those are in Western Australia, Western Australia. Um, it's, it's fairly large, it's uh, eight or nine inches the other way, what you're seeing in the wall, the face of it, yeah, fairly large product, yep. So, but, but, but it's a nice unit, and um, but all those things that we're talking about become very important the higher voids you run because you got less margin of error. Okay? Alright. So you see my straight edge right here. Alright? I got that. What am I doing? I'm hitting the core. It's sticking outside the cap. Same thing. They were having problems. They were getting header cracks from that opening up. They called us from Flyce over there. They call and say, you got to come. It's Thursday afternoon. From L.A., it's a 14 and a half hour flight. So I got to get from Canton to Atlanta to L.A. So I got about six hours in that. Then I got 14 and a half hours to get to Australia. I get there. They got to die on the machine. They want to run. I said, oh, hold on a minute. I got 26 hours travel time here. Let's take this thing off. Let's see what we got going on. Because I have no clue. I'm just, I'm going at it as a, I don't, you know, anything could be possible. So I hang it on the hoist. I get it over to the side. And my hand runs across the front of it. 
And I'm like, I turn it back around, I'm like, the damn cores are sticking outside the cap. And this, this particular core is like an inch and a quarter long. So we go measuring cores. They're all over the map. They got them from a Chinese supplier. The, the wear was good on them. I'll give them that. The wear, they were silicon carbide and the wear is really good, but they, dimensionally they weren't that great. So we get some, we find some in their group, because you notice you got, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You got 10 cores on top, 10. So that's a 20 core product. That's a 20 core product there. So we had to find 20 cores that was all the same size. We get them put in, we start running brick, there we go, We're making good product again, all right? Making good product again. So they flew me all the way to Australia to find out that the cores were sticking outside the cap. <laughs> so that's why we still put that in the presentation, because it still happens. It still happens. Did they have a Betty on the diet, Say again? Was there a Betty on the diet? Was there a belly on the die? Uh, I don't think so. A concave, a concave. Oh, a concave? Uh, not on that product. It's straight. It's straight on that product. Does it look like it or something? No, it's certain kinds of high core. Oh, yeah. Right. It depends on the body or whether we do. And that, yeah, we, we still do that a lot in the States, too, depending on what people's core configuration is. The larger profile products you get into it, when you start making. Utilities and, and, and monarchs, you know, 16 inch brick, stuff like that, you usually start running convex uh, to, so when it fires, it shrinks down, shrinks down flat. I, a lot of my commercial customers do that. I mean, I even got people that run modular brick like that, you know. And then, and then, and then they'll run velour stuff on a, on a commercial product, and I'll even convex the blades. And so, so, so like if I'm running a, uh, a 64th convex on the cap or, or a 32nd convex on the cap, then I'll actually put that in the blade too so when you got a straight blade, you're not just velouring off your, your, your hump there that, you, that you've built in. So there's a lot, of, a lot of things you can do to make a good flat product. And, and i tell you another thing I have. I have customers in Australia, not so much in the States, but they'll actually want convex headers. And the reason they want convex headers is, is because when you package them on a dehacker, you know how you get them little chips from the corners, the corners hitting on the chips? If you put convex headers, you roll that header on the outside a little bit, and they don't chip as bad. So if you ever run into that in a plant somewhere, and you're having a little bit of issue, we can, we can, build, we can cut in a little convex on the headers, and then we'll, we'll, we'll decrease the chippage issue that way. That's all what people want. Next. All right. So that's it. I'll just I put this in here just to let y'all know that there's things out there that people are doing. And yes, sir. <coughs> so when the, when the cord is sticking out, mm -hmm. that shows up as cracks coming off the cord. Right. And 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 actually opening up on the header too, because it's because it's opening up. So yep. if it's right up even level with it, then you probably just have more cord cracks. Yep. You so want it recessed just a little bit, sixteenth of an inch. Alright, so run that video. This is just to let you know that people, this is a double stream on a 90 in, um, in Australia. So we're double streaming a 90 and what that does is, it's actually on this line with that product that you saw, but we're running two side by side and that's buffering like crazy. Maybe it'll catch up, we'll run it again the next time. But let it catch up and run it again. But anyway, what that does is most of the time what we do in the States is we're mostly making like, say we're making a king size brick that's two and a quarter or green. Try to run it again see if it'll do better. And then... Yeah, maybe it'll do better. Maybe it'll quit buffering here. But I made that mark on the column basically to show you how balanced these two columns are running side by side. And they ride right down there together the whole way. And they're running side by side. 
But when we're running these king size product and stuff like that in the states, we're actually hurting our auger efficiencies because we got an 18 inch auger and we're pushing this little three inch bed brick out by 10 inches long so you're not using the auger. So best case scenario, steel would jump up and down if they got a 40% efficiency off a of 90. They, they would celebrate, literally. They would celebrate at that. So what that means is, is you're only feeding out really about 40% of what you're putting in it at, a, at an effective rate, 40, 45%. That's very common. But that's because the profile of the product we make, we don't fill up that whole auger. So what we're doing here, when we put that double stream in for this high void stuff, auger efficiencies are like 75%. And the, and, and the auger wear is cutting, I, I mean, it, it extends the life like two times because you're actually feeding out what you're putting in it. So we could do this with a brick here in the United States, but the only thing that does, uh, the only thing that causes you an issue, remember this is a backing brick, all right? So most of us, what we do here in the States, we coat products, all right? We put sand on, we put slurry on and all that. Well now, if we do that, then we gotta figure out how to coat both these columns that are running side by side. So that's what draws everybody back. They're like, oh, maybe we don't wanna do that. You know, cause they don't, they don't wanna figure out how they're gonna get consistent slurry coverage. But the auger efficiency is just a lot, a lot higher and you run so much easier because what does everybody do on, on a set machine most of the time when the, just about everybody. Do they run one column up there and push it through the wires? You usually have a doubler. You're either, you got a, you got a column pusher, it's either pulling back and letting another one come in and then pushing both at the same time. You rarely just push one column in there. So what this does, that eliminates that. So right there, you're already saving time. You've got two columns already run up there side by side, pushing through the cutter. You don't have to double them up, you just push them through. So there's some advantages to it. So if you're thinking outside the box one day and you want to do a project to increase efficiencies or something like that, it's worth a look. It's worth a look. Because we're doing it. I mean, we're doing it. It's, it's not, it's, we figured out how to do it and all that and it works. Next. And I don't know, do, do we need to do a break, Jim, or something? Because this one's about over. Huh? This one's about over, so we can do a break whenever you get. Okay. Well, whenever. All right. This is the same product, and the reason I got them both in here is because one is Midland and one's Austral Brick, but uh, this is Austral Armandale, and we actually direct set this product at 50% void. All right. So the other one is indirect set. It's got the old uh, Sarik, uh, what do they call that, Chinook system or something where yeah. they load those trays and they go through that high volume air dryer and, and all the trays go through there instead of being on a rack car. Yeah. yeah, well that first one you saw, that's indirect set. So it's a little bit softer. This one's direct set right on the car. It's at Austral Armandale. They're extruding this eight millimeter web thickness at 50% void at about 14.5% moisture. That, it's serious. But it's all in the bridge design. Because we don't have a horizontal bridge bar in these units. We have all vertical bridge bars. All vertical bridge bars. No horizontal bridge bars. So we had to figure out how to make it run. <laughs> we had to figure out how to make this stuff run. So you can r see if that video's quality's any better. It's yeah, it's going to run without... But they're actually trimming this one. They actually blade trim it. And you'll see... Gosh, I hate this buffering crap. You'll actually see that they double stack it after the, after the slug cutter here. They actually pick it up and stack it so you got four columns going into the cutter. Try to run it again. Is it it, yeah, it is. It's a backing brick. How y'all like that drag bar? Anybody use a drag bar? Anybody use a drag bar? Not a bar. Everybody got plows? Plows. All right. 
Drag bar, I've run into situations with materials that drag bar is the best option. Yeah. Ah, it ain't gonna it ain't gonna run. That's all right. I don't know why it's doing that on there on there. Go on to the next one. Alright. So we get into blade frames. Heard you talking about blade frames, wire frames, trimming bricks, stuff like that. So we put the we, we, we talk about this to our customers a lot because it makes a difference. When you put a velour frame on a unit, you notice ours hinges out of the way and all that. You don't have to take it off. Say we was going to go from queens to mods. All we do is hinge this open, unbolt that. The whole center section dial pass right by the, the hinge. And then put it on there, put a new one on there, close it. It's got alignment, alignment flaps right there. Your holes, your your wing nuts go right through this hole right here. Your your bolts, tighten it up, ready to go again. It's right where it's supposed to be. No wrenches, no wrenches, all knobs. We make all the knobs. Don't need a freaking wrench. Knob. Easy for the operator. He ain't got wrenches laying around. All that hinges out of the way. All right. So when you put this on, you need to pay attention to how you put it on. All right. Mount as close to the, the die surface as possible. Uh, same distance. Right, left, top, bottom. All right. Uh, because the reason you're doing that is if I start trimming this left side before I'm trimming this right side, what's it do? It pulls that side. You know, same way. You know, so pay attention to that. All right, have it mounted on there close, nice and close, even all the way around. All right, <laughs> setting up a plow. So many times to go in a plant and the plow's actually trimming the column. <laughs> it's down on the column, causing a lot of resistance. You want it close, but you just want it close enough to get the trimmings off. Okay, all right, and then um, one thing that the Australians do that I hate, they run a common, all right, what they call a common. And they trim one side and they leave the other side smooth. That is totally against extrusion. You know, that's, that's totally against extrusion. So they got a smooth surface on one side and a velour surface on the other header. And I hate that, but that, that really falls into this here. So you try to minimize the amount that you're trimming when you have to do that, all right? All right, so... Don't think that oh I hadn't bought a I hadn't bought a cap or a die box whatever you want to call it man I, I ain't bought one a year well you ain't helping yourself because when you start trimming too much you cut out compaction you slow extrusion you run too much waste to the returns returns de air material I already told you they'll go down the center of the auger they'll show up in the center of the brick and it'll cause laminations all right so don't trim too much if you if you want a nice frame, just let us know. We do blade frames and, and wire frames. Doesn't make no difference. Just let us know. Because that's a nice good setup. All right, next. All right, lubrication. Everybody in here lubricates their die. All right, everybody in here does that. Why? Because we stiff extrude. Okay, in, years ago, when people soft extruded, material was fluid. Like water, it ran through the die. You didn't need lubrication. Well, now you need lubrication. What does lubrication do? It extends. It extends the longevity of the die. Makes the die last longer. Ease of material flow. And reduction in column temperature. All right. That's that. That's why we lube. That being said, you want enough lube that you're lubing the outside of the product and it's not dripping all over the place. I don't know how many times I go to a plant and they'll say, you'll have the op, see, it'll be one of the two. They'll say, oh, we need more oil on it because we've got to have it down here in the set machine on a slug pusher. Well, that's kind of the wrong way to do it because they want it to slide off the slug belt real nice and good. So they want to drain, the, you know, wet the crap out of it down there in the extruder. Well, why don't we put a, you know, a little drip down here on the belt at the set machine and, and extrude right, all right? Or they'll say, Oh, turn the oil back just on the bottom. Well, with good extrusion, 
I like to have all my lube ports open equal all the way around and they're all coming out a little bit all the way around because we've got the lubrication ring in there and we get a solid coat all the way around not choke it off on the bottom to have a dry bottom or something like that if you're starting to need a dry bottom or things like that we lubricate with soap um, we sell a product called RP3 which is a water water soluble soap we're doing that a lot of places and in probably one day it'll come up for y'all to have to do it because I've already had uh, a company in California called Pacific Clay, the EPA out there in California, their local state EPA made them do it. They said, you cannot use brick oil anymore. You, you've got to find an alternative. Well, so they contacted us and we said, hey, we're, all, we're doing this all over the place. And one reason we lube with soap is, is because another reason is if you're making commercial products and you're putting any glazes or slurries on a commercial product, a lot of times oil causes a, a, a lamination underneath there and the slurries and the glazes don't want to stick to the body as bad, but when you use soap, it evaporates away really, really fast and then that adheres, all those slurries and slips and glazes and all that will adhere to the column easier on the soap when you don't have the oil slip underneath. So there's multiple reasons why why you can do that. Typically what we've been doing in the states is selling this system here. What this is, is a, it's a Neptune chemical pump. The reason we use a Neptune chemical pump is it'll pump water solubles, it'll pump oils, it doesn't care. It, it's not, the, the, it, it has a corrosion resistance on the inside so it doesn't matter if it pumps water or anything, it'll pump all day. So. They pump a lot of chemicals. They do a lot of car washes and stuff where you're mixing soaps and waxes and things like that to spray in the, in the car washes. We use it. It's an effective um, dial pump. You can change your pressure and your flow on it. Uh, so you got a single, what we recommend is this, you got a single motor and two pumps. We do one for the back and one for the front. That way you have pinpoint flow for back and front. Because normally you have more pressure on the back of the die than you do the front of the die. Normally. Depending on how stiff you extrude. But most, most places in the states we find out in stiff extrusion that we have more pressure on the back than we do the front of the die. So, and that's the way we set the manifolds up too. So we set the manifold up where it looks like the die. So when you look right here and you look at the back, it's got six ports and they look just like the die. So you got center, left, and right on the back. And then on the bottom, you got left, center, and uh, I mean right, center, and left. All right, so that's what you got. And then when, when you go over to the die, then this is your die manifold, the, the, the cap. I know we have terminologies. <coughs> Raymond always calls a cap a die because the die is a finished size, right? But we call it a cap too because that's what the customers do. But you have four lube points on the cap. So you got top left, top right, bottom left, and bottom right. Looks just like the looks just like the die. Manifold looks just like the die. Alright. Next. Alright. So how we lube. Alright? How we lube. We lube different than the competitor. Alright? We operate differently than the competitor. The competitor has a, has an all, brawn, steel, any of them. They have a craven, they have a continuous taper die. And what I mean by continuous taper is they start here and they go all the way down to the finished size. Okay? We don't do that. We have a compact, relaxed system and that's why we get a higher green strength. All right, so you do, think about it like this. Anybody ever made a snowball or a mud ball? I pick, pick some snow up and I pack it one time and I throw it at Jim, it falls apart before it gets to him. But if I pick it up and I pack it and I relax it, I pack it and I relax it, pack it and I relax it, and I throw it at Jim, I can knock him out with it. All right, so that's how we extrude. All right. So each section, we do that, right? So 
Coming into the oil ring, see the taper. I compacted. I went into a flat, and I relax. Okay. Enter the bridge ring. Steep compaction. Enter a flat, and I relax. Go into the center section. Compact. Enter a flat. I relax. Die. Compact. Relax. Compact. Relax. I don't know how many of y'all counted that when you came out, but we've only got a three section die there, and I've got one, two, three, four, five times that I've compacted and relaxed. And it it really it really densifies the material. I mean it really it really doesn't. Alright, so those are compaction lips which also serve as lubrication lips. Alright? So the first place I lube is right here. Between the oil ring and the bridge ring. Alright? So I got six ports of lube. I got center, off thirty degrees, and off thirty degrees. Center on the bottom, off thirty and off thirty. Okay? And then I've got a lip. You see this lip right here? Alright? So I've got a lip there. What that lip's doing is that's carrying that lubrication. So if I stick my hand in the front like this, I'm going to hit those lips. Right? Alright. So I've got this lubrication lip. So I pump oil in and it stays in that reservoir right there. Okay? So the material's riding on that lubrication. As that wears, this is also a qual uh, a quality check. You know when that dies wore out. Okay? So I'm lubing right there in the back. Alright? Then I come up and I lube again between the back section of the cap and the center section. Right here. So the lube's going in here and back toward the center section and comes out in the corner. Alright? On each of the corners. Same difference. I got the I got the lip there, which you see. So I've got the lip there, and I'm putting lube in that lip, not in the column. All right. So how do I know it's wore out? How do I know it's wore out? Okay. Huh? Showing up in the bridge. Yeah, but that's too late. All right. So I've dug the die out. All right. I dig, I dig the die out, and I'm doing my inspections. All right. So I'm filling. I start out with an eighth inch lip, brand new. All right. So the first place you're going to wear is the cap, right? Because it's the smallest opening and it wears faster because there's more friction. That's the good thing about a sectional die. You don't have to reline the whole die, just reline the portion that's wore out. Alright? So, in this cap it's going to wear out more. So this lip between the back of the cap and the die is going to wear out faster. So if I don't have that lip anymore, if I get down to that 30 second range right there, I'm going to start uh, 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 I'm going to run the possibility of being able to penetrate because that oil has nowhere to go. Well, if I'm like this, I've got a place to be as oil. But if I'm like that, nowhere to go but in the product. Alright? Nowhere to go but in the product. Alright? So, I know that if I go right here and I feel this, that the, my center section is wore out and it needs to be realigned if there's no lip right there. Or my die is wore and it's too big for the center section. All right. So, and then, your temperature will rise then? if you're not lubing right, yes, sir, you get increased okay. column temperature. Okay. Yep. Okay. And then always on the front of a die, if you're penetrating on the corners, on the corners, top, bottom, of the header, that's the front of the die. You can't do it in the back. If you penetrating on the back, then you're going to be in the center of the brick, and you're going to get the bridge bridge lamination, and that can be here in the back. Okay. All right. Now. This right here doesn't wear out as fast as this. But we feel it's very important to educate the customer to watch for this lubrication point because that's what carries your lube. All right? If you're in here and you run a K die or you run a, a GN die or you run an L die, then you've got this little metal ring back there in the back and it's got a couple o-rings in it and you change that and it, it wears out pretty pretty quick that little metal ring with those o-rings and o-rings don't work real good either because they push out and tear and stuff like that so 
And then on the and then on the front, usually on a K die, you don't even lube. You just put so much in the back to try to get out out to the front. All right. Or and then, and then the L die, they tried they, they they tried to do it similar to what we do, and they tried to start lubing the front. So that's a little bit a little bit different. So they did give you a little bit of lube on the front on the L die. So, but what I'm saying is that gives us a gauge, and that's why we feel like it's very important that when we come out to talk to the guys that are using the equipment, to the supervisor, to look at what they got, inspect, and say, hey, you might be running into an issue right here. Just like we were over here this morning, and uh, on one machine, he's got a unit the back end's pretty, pretty freaking wore out. So he's going to have to send it back for reliving. But on the other side, both the units look pretty good. But he knows it. Mike knows it. He's planning on sending it back. But that's the, that's the way, you know, that, that would go as far as reline. And most of our customers in the States send their units back to us to reline. You, there is a few in the States that do their own relines, but not many. He, Denton's one of them, and he relines a cap. Just a cap. That's it. I don't think we have any here in the States. Yeah. I, yeah, we don't have any. But in Australia, South Africa, we teach them how to do it because economically, it's more feasible for us to just ship them liners than to ship liners and housings because of weight. So we ship, we make jigs and we show them how to do it. All right. But in the States, with freight the way it is, there's really no reason for somebody in the States to do it. All right. Next. That's just the pump. You've already seen the pump. Go ahead, Nick. All right. So, the, I, I touched a little bit about here on the the RP3 that we lube with, and I, I recommend it if 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 it, if you're looking for alternatives. Usually, when we do a die startup, I always if I start out with a new customer, I always start out on their die lube, whatever they're using, apples to apples, and then I'll run some some RP3, bring a sample, and if and if they want to, you know, we'll run it, show them it works. If they decide they want to do it, then they can do it. Because it's, it's also cheaper. <laughs> like like brick oil today will cost about six, a little over $6 a gallon, most people I see paying for brick oil, you know, like a processed lube. And when you do, when you d dilute RP3 about 30 to 1, which is usually what we end up at, 30% water, 1% soap, it's about 76 cent a gallon. So as soon as you're running, you're saving money. Yeah, I mean, as soon as you turn the machine on, you're saving money. All right, next. All right, so talk about header laminations, all right? So you can run this video here, and I'll show you how to check for header laminations, all right? Hopefully this one runs good. All right, so I'm cutting the header off right there, just the head. And I take it in my hand on both ends, and then I take pressure and break it. All right, all right. Now we can look on the inside of that brick there, and we see there's no lamination. But if you have a lamination on that brick, it's going to look real smooth, okay? Like a cut, like a like you like you cut it with something. It's going to be like a real smooth edge. All right. So the first thing, whenever say say I do a new die startup today, I'm in your plant. And I do a new die startup. I get, I've, I've checked the lubrication ahead of time. We start running some material through the die. I get some upset machine. I'm trying to determine, hey, do I want to set this or not? So the first thing I do, I get me a brick and I hold it up in the light. What am I looking for when I hold it up in the light? I'm looking for web pulling, and I'm looking for oil. If I've got oil in the cores, I got way too much lube on the back. All right, but there's a point where you could have that turned down, but you still be penetrating and you don't see it. So that's why it's important to cut those heads off, hold that in your hand, and break it. And when you break it, it should have it should not be smooth on the inside. You shouldn't see any oil. If it's on the edge of that head where you break it, and you've got any oil in it, you'll see on the edge, and it'll be slick looking from the oil that you've put in there. And a lamination you've created. So you, do, when you break that in your hand, you want it to look separate particle size, no little shelves or, or lines, and you don't want it to have those smooth spots in it. All right. 
and it'll and you'll know if you're penetrating with oil, it'll just pop not like a straight line, just a straight line. If it, if you're not penetrating, it'll be real dense and it'll break in a jagged, a little jagged line. It'll be jagged. It won't be straight because oil will just make it a straight line. Next. All right. So reverse lips. Okay. Reverse lips can cause lamination. So earlier I told you at extrusion I got a lip like this. Well, you run a die so long, or you put a cap on a on a center section that's too big, and you get a shelf like this, then clay builds up right there, and then you're running clay over clay, and that'll cause lamination. All right. So you should never have a lip like this through the die. All right, because that'll cause lamination. One thing that the competitors do is if you order a die, they'll say, give me your rear opening on their sheet and give me your exit opening. All right? In our system, we do not recommend that. All right? There's a reason that you got angles and tapers in a die. All right? Once you, if I've got a cap and my, and my die base is getting worn, and I keep opening that back opening like this, that causes column swell because I'm changing that angle in that die like this all the time. So that causes column swell, then I have size issues. All right? My green size is no longer what it normally is. All right? So that's why opening that back of that cap is totally against good extrusion principles. It creates resistance, it creates heat, and it's not a, it's not a good thing. So that's why in our system, we got a sectional die that we can reline that you don't change those angles and you get the same size product coming out of that cap over and over again. All right? So no reverse lips because it causes tearing. It wipes the oil off. It'll wipe the oil off. It'll, it'll cause lamination. Next. All right. So this is another thing. You see people that will run tapered cores and blunt cores. All right? Blunt cores do the same thing as that that I was talking about with that reverse lip. They stop clay here, and then you're running clay over clay. So if I set up a die, generally I never run a blunt core. I always run a tapered core so that I get compaction uh, over the core. Now I have had cases where I had a fast center and as a temporary fix, I put a blunt core in the middle to slow it down. But that was only a temporary fix. I wouldn't have never stayed that way. I'm gonna do something else to change that flow later. All right. So tapered cores, they'll promote knitting. All right, next. All right, safety considerations on a die. You can take this, but I always feel obligated to tell you this. All right. You can do it your way, whatever you want to do, but I think this is proper startup and shutdown procedures. All right. So at the end of the day, say we're a single shift operation and we're going to stop and, and we're going to come back in the morning and run. All right. So I say that while I'm running, I cut the vacuum and I run it rotten. I run it till, till I have a column coming out with no vacuum on it. And then... So I ensure material has no vacuum on it. And then when I come in in the morning, when I start up, turn the machine on, let the column move, flip my vacuum on, build up vacuum, and run. I think from a safety standpoint, that's the best way to do it. All right? And I think you run into less startup issues when you do that. A lot of times if you let that sit overnight or a long period of time over a weekend, if you're fortunate enough to have a five day a week operation or something like that, and you, and you let it sit over the weekend, I think a lot of times you fight, you fight material and start up in the morning because you've got that hard material sitting in the, sitting in the die. All right? And there's been situations in our industry that you had inexperienced operators and you had an inexperienced supervisor and some people got hurt because they were starting the extruder, it wouldn't push, and they kept jogging it. They built up steam, they blew the dial off the front of the machine, 
Broke the guy's shoulder, broke his arm, knocked his teeth out. So, and he didn't have a job no more. He, he lawsuits, all this kind of crap. And it was all because he was uneducated about what could possibly happen. Doesn't everybody take the vacuum off at the end of the day? No. We don't run and ride like you said. But once we take the vacuum off and clean it out, we'll, we'll bump it and it'll still run some uh, material out. Because once we clean it out, it goes all the way to the Yeah, you're talking about rotting down your vacuum chamber and everything. Yeah. 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 Yep. But it's a good idea. <coughs> all right. Because I, I do have some facilities. And I don't know that it's any of y'all, but I have some facilities, man, they just turn the yep. thing off and they walk off. Oh, no. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> yeah, we run into that a good day. Yeah, we run into it a lot. I mean, like, why do you do that for? Yep. And then you tell them that story. You know, yeah. We, we, we bring the, the extruder out down first. Right. Before we just cut it off. Once right. It, they, they give them soft material. Right. So one thing I'd say, and you see I highlight it, never start an extruder up with a die with a dry plug. And I see people do this too. They'll dig up to the bridge and stop. <coughs> Just cleaned out. All right? Because you get dry patches hanging in the cores and stuff like that. You get web tearing, web pulling, all that. Just don't start one up with dry material in it. You know, it's been sitting over there. If a column uh, doesn't move, when you turn that extruder on, don't run it. Shift it over, dig it out. Cause you, somebody get hurt. Cause you can build up a steam bomb in a hurry. Because you're you got water in there. You're adding water, and and it's turning and it's not moving. It'll build up a steam bomb, and that steam is deadly. It'll blow that sucker right off there. Yep. And then. Inconsistency in uh, material temper, moisture content, and vacuum causes low column density, <coughs> variation in size, variation in texture, distortion, low green strength, change in column temperature, internal stress, downtime due to handling equipment, low product yield, downgraded product overtime, and little to no profit. All right, next. I think that's it on that one. All right, so who we are, I told you a little bit. Greg Dean, he's the owner. He's on Raymond Products since 1999. If y'all have met Greg Dean, y'all know he's a very enthusiastic, uh, passionate person. He knows his product inside and out. He's, he's educated. He's an accountant by education, but he's an entrepreneur at heart. So he did public accounting for a long time. He worked for a big firm in, in Ohio. He handled a lot of high-dollar, high-profile companies. And he got tired of wearing a suit and tie every day. And he had made some investments, made some money, wanted to find a company. He knew the guy that owned Raymond that wasn't very enthusiastic about the product. He ended up buying Raymond. And he's done wonders with Raymond since 1999. I mean, we've done additions. We've added customers. We're out there hitting it all the time. If you're working for Raymond, you're passionate about what you do. And and that's what and that's the way we operate, just like he does. All right. And then me, I'm Greg Camp. Greg Myers, uh, he runs Raymond. He's an old brick guy. He worked for General Clay for years, all that. And yes, if you work at Raymond, and your name's not Greg, before long you have to change it. <laughs> now, Mark, Marky. Oh, yeah, I got seniority. Over there you go. He's got. You've been there longer than all of us, so you don't have to change his name. There you go. So, uh, some of them call me different. Yeah. So, uh, Mark, he's out here traveling just like I am. Greg Dean is too. Uh, Greg Dean, I, he travels all around. I think he came out here last year with Mark. Um, Jonathan Baker runs the engineering department. He's a mechanical engineer. 
anytime you get a drawing from us or something like that, you'll see JB on it because he's the one that did it. Or you might see a young guy named Jansen Allen, which he's he's a mechanical engineer also, and he works for Jonathan. And then we got another guy because workload's so heavy. We got another boy down there, and uh, his name is uh, Michael Antonelli, and he's a he's still a student. But uh, he's a smart kid, and uh, he's working down there now. And then Donnie Roberts. Donnie Roberts has been with Raymond for 30, 38 years. And uh, some people's probably seen him. He, he kind of used to look like Gallagher. He had <laughs> his bald on top. He had his long curly locks. And then now his head's fully shaved. So he don't have that anymore. So he don't look like Gallagher anymore. But Donnie's a creative type. Uh, does a lot of project work for us, and uh, he's good at coming up with stuff. We just recently uh, built a slug cutter that doesn't have travel. It was something that we wanted to do. Uh, actually, got forced into doing it because I wanted to. I wanted y'all know Jim Harris Auto Systems. Jim Harris with Auto Systems. He makes this column that does this column cutter. It doesn't have travel to it. And I wanted to sell his product overseas. And I stayed on it because it was a good product. And I've been around the industry and it was a good product. I wanted to sell it. And he would never let me because he didn't want to do that much work. If anybody knows Jim, he likes to select what he does. He, he lives in Ramster, North Carolina, and he only does what they want to do. They keep it small. All right? So he wouldn't let me sell this thing. Because I think he thought we was going to sell too many of them. So we decided we just make one ourselves. So we've made these column cutters that don't have travel. And uh, they're nice. Uh, uh, I got a video on my phone, but I don't have one on my computer. But um, they're, so we are selling those. Donnie kind of did that. Donnie helped me come up with the new QC die. He took my ideas and came up with that. Uh, Donnie does an ADA uh, paver uh, press machine for the little nibs on the for the blind crosswalk things. He does he he built one of those. Uh, he does a lot of Donnie does a lot of project work. So and and we're growing. Uh, we grew the caching side of the business and grew Raymond at the same time. And I told Mark this year um, our plans are we blew the doors off the foundry and. Now we're going to blow the doors off of Raymond. So Greg Dean, he's already bought a couple of houses that are right next to Raymond's shop, and we're going to tear them down and, and build on to that because we need more space. So We have added equipment in there and people, but we're just running out of space. So anybody in here that doesn't have a Raymond die, it's not just a sales pitch. I, I love brick manufacturing. So, I mean, it's... Whether you're making brick on whatever die you're making it on, all of this stuff applies. Because you can make crap brick out of anything if you don't pay attention to details. And, and you let it go. Like I said in that one statement, nothing lasts forever. You've got to maintain it. You've got to buy new parts. There's, there's things you've got to do. So, and I, so, but if you're interested in, in a Raymond die at all, then all you've got to do is let some of us know. Give us a holler. Let us know. And uh, we can come out, set up, you know, anybody that doesn't have them. We come out, and we've always done a uh, no money up front <coughs> trial basis. We'll make a unit for your, for your plant, and you'll know how much it costs up front. And then you won't pay a dime. We'll come out, we'll set it up, we'll run it, and when it does what it says, what we say it'll do, then you pay for it. And there ain't too many people out there that'll run that. But but that's the way we've always operated and we've always been successful doing that. Uh, so, and then, uh, I believe that's it. I do have, I don't know how long you want this to go, but we don't want to do any more. But, but, but I appreciate all y'all's time. I got some stuff to give away. But first thing, first thing I want to do, First thing I want to do is somebody, somebody, and it doesn't have to be verbatim and what I said up there, but 
Somebody give me a definition of vacuum. The air. <laughs> you, that's, that's good. That's good. Moving the atmosphere air. Yep. It's, that, he's on it. He's on it. So it's it's Can lower. Well below the atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure. That's right. So give both of them something, Mark. There. Mark, give you. We got shirts and hats and all that. All right. So somebody tell me one reason we lubricate a die. Huh? Balance out the die. And what's another one? Reduce friction. All right, we got a couple out here. So longevity of the entire inside of the die. Redu reduction of column temperature. Here we go, Mark. Got two more up here. Three more. That's right. Make longevity of the inside of the die. There we go. Hold on one second. He got some stuff. Right here. Right here. Right here. Right there. Don't cut yourself with those knives. But when you look, you got. Uh, you got Raymond on one side and Castings USA on the other, and they got our phone numbers on there. And I'm going to get some of my... You can have that. I'm going to get some of my cards and put up here, and Mark, Mark put some of his up there too. Uh. All right. So, what what year? What year did uh, Raymond Products start? That's for sure. That's when that's when Greg Dean bought it. Seventy two was Castings USA. I I'll, I'll give you seven. I I'll give you Castings. Y'all remember that? It's Castings USA. Give them, give them something down there, Mark. Right here on the end. But that was Castings USA. But when was Raymond? No, we ain't that old. 1958. There you go. 1958. All right. Great. There you go. All right. Uh, where are we at? Ohio. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, it's right there. New Philadelphia. Right? <laughs> I used to drive by when I visited my grandparents. There you go. Hey, there's a lot of people in Acme that are from that area. A lot of people. Mike McIntosh, he's from Logan, Ohio. Jim Ogg. Jim Ogg. Um, Luke, Luke, Luke Ogenthal. I'm from Ohio. What, what part are you from? Uh, Athens. My son goes to OU, the youngest one. Is that right? Yeah, he goes to OU down there. Monitoring his, uh, yeah, monitoring his drinking and all that. Yeah, that's the number one party school, I'll tell you that. That's true. All right. All right, so somebody, somebody already answered. They, Greg Dean bought the company in 1999. All right. What does what will happen if you're running a bridge that's uh, real knife shaped in the back end of it? What does that cause? What will happen to your if it's sharp? If it's real sharp in the back end. Yep. Yeah, there you go. There you go. All right. What's it cause if what does a column do if the bridge is set up? Uh, too low. It's gonna go. It's gonna go down if it's set up too low. That's right. All right. What What would a column do if I've got if I'm thicker on the left side and thinner on the right side here? What's it gonna do? It's gonna take that turn just like that. All right. Here we go. All right. Yep. There you go. Uh. <laughs> ah, try and think of something else. Something else. Anybody got any questions about anything I said? Oh yeah, I didn't cover that. But. That's in the corner of your column. When you can, when you run your column out, and you can push your finger in the corners and got wet checks. Like oil running out of it. Like the, the letter thing, or the letter will. Too, too much oil pressure on the front. That's right. <coughs> on the front of the die. There you go. If you've got if you've got a a, a reverse lip and reverse cause lip. it yeah no the oil has nowhere to go so it'll penetrate too. That's a good point. That's a good point. All right. 
All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave some of my cards up here because I hope somebody's interested that's not a customer. <laughs> and I hope somebody that is a customer might be interested in something else down the road. Yeah. You don't get proper water mixing, all right? So what that is is you get segregation of moisture in the in the pug sealer. Yeah, but what, I mean, what does that look like when it comes out in the finished product? And what kind of well, you don't get good mixing, so you have inconsistent amps on the extruder. Oh, okay. Yep. So that's all, that's Up and down on the on the amperage on the extruder. This causes for a soft break. Yep. Soft hard. Soft hard. Soft hard. Right. All right. Jim, you got anything? You're doing good. All right. All right. All right. So anytime, anytime y'all need something or y'all are y'all interested in, a, you know, you're interested in, you got an issue, we love, we love, uh, we've gotten a lot of plants before because they gave me their worst problem. They, or they gave us their worst problem. And I've told them, just give me your, give me your number one heartache. Give me your number one heartache. You know, a certain product, certain body, certain size. See what I can do with it. One thing I can say is these guys will help you out. And a lot of times we don't use their help when we should be, you know. Don't hesitate to call. I know every plant has got dye problems, balance problems. I mean, everybody, nobody's immune from these problems. Right. Use these guys. They'll help you out. And from experience, you know, they're, they're there to help. So, what's the worst phone call you'll make when you're, you're in, and not get a hold of somebody? Like, yeah, that's the worst phone call you. That's right. Call my cell phone right there. You're going to get a hold it's of on me. there. You're going to get a hold of me. Yep. You're going to get a hold of somebody in the office. Somebody's going to talk to you, and they're going to put you in touch with Greg, me, Greg Dean. Yeah, we don't have it. We don't. We don't like answering services. We. We like a person that answers the phone. A lot of times we're in the plants and don't and can't answer our phone. But we'll cut. We, but we will. We're going to get back to you. Yep. And I do text. I do all forms of communication: text, email, social media. Social media. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Snapchat. My wife puts me on all that. I get crazy Snapchats from her every day. So, it's, she likes to change her face and <coughs> all that crap. And so that's a. Let me let me get, tell you. I mean. We got started with Raymond. Of course, I was familiar with Raymond at Sealy because we I used him at Sealy for ten years. Now I didn't start that, but at Elgin, we started out with the competitor. Okay, and obviously you front row use competitors dies, and a lot of people. Just, I mean, they're happy with it. There's there's nothing wrong with what you're doing there. What we were doing was not working. It simply wasn't working, and we called Raymond. We'd already bought the competitors' die and spent money on it, but we were struggling. And we called Raymond, and they got to work on it. And as soon as they got that die ready, they came out, and on day one, we were making quality brick without all the problems we had been experiencing. Yeah. Day one. Yeah. So they do have answers when we've got when we've got problems that we can't seem to get around. So we have one little success story and. Uh, that I that I always like to tell, but uh, y'all familiar with Pine Hall Brick, right? Okay, JC Steele owns Pine Hall Brick, and they built a plant in Fairmont, Georgia, and this was in the 90s, late 90s or something like that. I wasn't with Raymond, but they built a plant in Fairmont, Georgia. They got started. They couldn't make a paver. They were they were making pavers. They couldn't make one. It was a state of the art paver plant. And they couldn't make one. So finally, they called Raymond, and uh, it's it's the cousin, is the one that was running Pine Hall. He calls Raymond. And he says, "Look, we got all this material, and we got this brand new plant. And we can't make a paver. Can't make one worth of crap." So Raymond went down there, made good pavers. Pine Hall. They changed over the other plant in Fairmont. All of Madison and all that. Well, then when the downturn hit, Steele said, look, we can't have this. You know, y'all can't run Raymond. You can't run Raymond. You've got to run Steele. So 
they work they actually took our dye back and they tried to figure out everything about it and tried to make one like it and all that and they never went to a, they never went to the type of dye that we have they still had a continuous taper dye even though they had it right in front of them well they started running uh, steel dyes because they were forced all right so then when we go down there, we still go down there and call on them because they buy some stuff from us and stuff like that. And I actually had a paver plant, the paver plant guy there in um, Fairmont, Georgia, looked me in the eye and he goes, yep, when we have a problem, we put the Raymond dot back on. And then when we get through it, we put the steel dot back on. <laughs> and he tells me that. And I was like, what? Yeah. But I can understand it. I mean, in, in their point, I guess I can understand it a little bit, but you know, it's kind of bad when you own the company and they're using the competitor's die. But, you know, we've struck out before. We've struck out before. And, but we're going to work through it. But we're going to work through it. That's what we always say. We don't give up. Somebody give up on us before we gave up on the project. So, all right, we appreciate that. We appreciate all the business that Acme Brick gives us. And I appreciate all your time. And I hope you weren't bored to death or anything like that. Very and, good. And I know, I know it's simplified. Some of it was simplified, but sometimes it's just that simple. It's just that simple. Yep. All right. Thank y'all. Thank you. Yep. I can, if, if y'all want a hat up here, y'all can, y'all can get a hat. If I, if I didn't, and grab my card. To simplify, honestly, that's, we prefer that. Yep. That's the only way to go. Yep.